welcome everyone to another Sacred Wisdom podcast. In today's episode, we will be discussing the reset of Great Tartaria. Now, I know some of you believe that Tartaria didn't exist, but this is very far from the truth. And what we are very interested in, all of us, is how this was reset, how this was erased, how this society kind of just disappeared and I am here with the amazing Stephen Denman to talk about these theories, concepts, and what actually happened. So welcome, Stephen. How are you? Hello, Zach. I'm doing well. Good to see you, brother. Well, look, let tell me more. So te- from your research, how was Great Tartaria reset? That's a very intricate and uh, wide-ranging question. The whole situation regarding the demise of great Tataria in northern Russia really is a process that took many, many centuries. It wasn't one event or one factor that actually completely destroyed the civilization of great Tataria in northern Russia. Uh, we have to remember that because of the, the very essence of the communities and societies of great Tataria, uh, with the aspirations that so many of the individuals, the residents in the towns and cities of Great Tataria had towards focusing on Christ consciousness and uh, personal and spiritual development, uh, and really not focusing on third-party debt-based usury, even if it was gold and silver backed. Uh, the, the, The idea of banks and corporations really had very little place in terms of emphasis in the civilization of, you know, Great Tataria. Okay, so in terms of, shall we say, natural climactic events or disasters, there were three main mud floods. So you had the first mud flood, the second mud flood, and the third mud flood. You also had uh, the situation with the Great Frost that also really led to the Great Thaw, which led to the mass inundation of, I think, the second mud flood at the very least. We know also that there was major volcanic activity going on at the time on planet Earth. And we have to remember that a lot of this led to what is now known as a type of nuclear winter in the Northern Hemisphere. So we have to remember that as an example of the volcanic eruptions that were taking place during this time that really contributed at the very least to the second mud flood. We have to remember on the 24th of September, 1812, through to the 15th of July 1815, Mount Tambora erupted on Sumbawa Island, which is located in the Lesser Sunda Islands chain of Indonesia and Southeastern Asia. Now, this, by the 31st of August 1816, led to a massive failure in crops across thousands of square kilometres of northern Russia, which prevented peasants in the visit villages and the towns from growing their fruits, vegetables, and cereal crops. So this led to various issues with a lack of food production and to famine to some extent and malnutrition. And the huge movements of the populations already was starting to take place. Because there had been so little in the way of sunlight um, for at least 20 years or just around 20 years after that disastrous event, when it came to the second mud flood, which took place um, on the 29th of October, 1834, we can see there wasn't really any roots or stabilization of the soil or gravel across thousands of square kilometers of farmland in northern Russia. That's defined geographically at, at that time as Great Tataria. So when these huge inundations of water resulting from rainstorms coming down through the polar Urals and the northern Urals, then spread out, you know, in a downward fashion. All this topsoil was then washed away, combined with gravel and silt and clay, creating torrential, um, you know, disastrous topographic changes that really, really completely destroyed much of the infrastructure in many areas of Great Tataria. In regards to the states and the mud floods as well, what would have created them mud floods? Would it have been a similar, would it yes. have been from, okay. So going back to the eruption of Mount Tambora on Sumbawa Island in Indonesia during 1812 to 1815, that was just one of many uh, volcanic activities that were going 
going on, there was other activities going on in the Japanese islands and many other parts of Southeast Asia for years leading up to that time, contributing to the expulsion into the atmosphere of billions of tons of sulfuric dioxide and other noxious gases that then helped to contribute to blotting out the sunlight and creating this nuclear winter event in the northern hemisphere. So it wasn't just the the Sorry, farmer. when you say nuclear winter, how, explain that a little bit more. Okay, you. so in terms of if you were, say, theoretically to have a thermonuclear war, it, it's postulated by physicists that the result would actually create a nuclear winter event by throwing billions of tonnes of radioactive ash and dust and soil up into the atmosphere that would then become lodged in the stratosphere, uh, especially in the northern hemisphere because of the jet streams that would then block out sunlight, preventing photosynthesis, therefore preventing crop growth across billions of acres of farmland or fertile agricultural land. So that would then lead to major food production shortages. So it was in terms of that scientific phrase, it's a comparative theory that has basically been postulated as to what would have happened with all this volcanic activity at the time. So that that hopefully explains it. Yeah. And so what with the mud floods? So we've had the, what that this is one concept, one theory. What other theories and ideas are there that, of how it was reset? Okay, well, when it comes to those, obviously, we have the more scientific-based, conventional-based uh, uh, versions of events that um, can be proven to some extent. There's a lot of documentation to do with the volcanic activity at the time, to do with crop failures in northern Russia, to do with the movements of populations. This is all fully documented. So it was documented by the, the, the Romanovs or the Tsars of Imperial Russia. It was documented by the, the dynastic Chinese. It was documented by Imperial Japan. So we know that that's there. But the, shall we say, the more conspiracy theory-based ideas that come to mind is that, and again, this is sheer speculation, but it's out there on blogs and forums, that some type of directed energy weapon or DEW uh, device was on at least one occasion used against Great Tataria in northern Russia to create a huge destructive electromagnetic wave uh, that caused either the first mud flood or perhaps the second mud flood, or it initiated what appeared to be natural events many decades after by creating perhaps changes in the jet stream. So how true any of that is, is anyone's guess. And obviously part of that conspiracy theory is that the people behind the use of such a directed energy weapon against Great Tataria were either the Jesuit order of the Roman Catholic Church and the Vatican City State on the Italian peninsula, or it's even been theorized that it was possibly the, the Rigelian Greys, also known as the Orion Greys or the Griadans, uh, who have planets and moons they inhabit uh, that orbit Rigel A, Rigel B, Rigel C, and Rigel D in the Orion constellation, uh, uh, you know, alongside their own drones that act as servants, which is the Zeta Reticulin type A Greys and the Zeta Reticulin type B greys now what proof just saying what proof what what evidence and how did people come to that conclusion um there really isn't a lot of proof there's nothing documented it's just being postulated by conspiracy theorists yeah. and that's why I tend to stay clear of such information so for example if we go to the time of uh Catherine Romanova she was the known as Empress Catherine the second or Catherine the Great of Imperial Russia, we know, for example, and it's fully documented, that on the 7th of November 1775, she had issued what is now known as the Statue on the Administration of the Provinces of the All-Russian Empire. And it was also known as the Statute of Administration of the Provinces 1775 and the Constitution for the Administration of the Governance of the Russian Empire. And all of, the, all of those different names really were for one piece of documented legislation under Catherine the Great. And all it really referred to was that she had fully intended to geographically and therefore geopolitically 
fragment great Tatari and northern Russia into smaller imperial provinces for control purposes, mainly economic and financial control purposes. So that's a very real documented historical mm. fact that can be placed there and can be shown. And the results of what she did, what Ka uh, Catherine Romanova actually did, also known as Catherine the Great, can be very evidentially seen in the various historical events that then started to take place after the 7th of November 1775 concerning Great Tataria. She was basically tasked with coming in to start the process of fragmenting geopolitically Great Tataria so that each of the different nation states would have its own provinces, its own polity, would therefore be controlled directly from Moscow and Moskva in Western Russia by the imperial Russian royal family, the Romanovs, the Tsars, and the Tsarinas, essentially. It so if that information is so well documented, how is it in the West they still see Great Tartaria, they're, well, or we're told, that it's this landmass beyond Europe, that it was a label given to people that live beyond Europe? Like... It's anonymous. So why is that the case? Because that is a, a huge bit of information you've just said, which I agree is fully documented and out there. So why is that not taken into the historic records of, of the British historic records or European records? Why is that not there? Well, the idea that Great Tataria was this, you know, eastern land, this vast expanse of northern Russia, the great unknown to Western Europeans, including, uh, you know, the British and therefore the landmass of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, was really just their way of loosely acknowledging that there was this very unified civilization that had existed for literally thousands of years. Okay, it had politically and culturally and spiritually morphed in time, but it was a multicultural, unified civilization in Great Tataria. So the Kyrgyz, the Uzbeks, the Tajiks, uh, the, the, all the different uh, Turkic groups there, they were all fully part of Great Tataria. That included actually many of the Mongolian tribes. So, so all, the, the, ob the obvious term there is divide and conquer, obviously. So it, correct. Yeah. yeah. So that's what was happening. And, you know, it's well known that Catherine Romanova or Catherine the Great was uh, very much aligned with European aristocracy. Right. We we cannot really un we cannot verify what the relationship was between the Russian Orthodox Christian Church and the Roman Catholic Church at the time, and whether there was or wasn't any collusion between the Jesuit order and the Orthodox Christian priests of the Russian Orthodox Church. You know, to also try and attempt to start to fragment geopolitically. Uh, the power bases or the influence, shall we say, of Great Tataria and Northern Russia. But that is what took place. That is documented. And obviously, if you combine that major political event with the second mud flood and then the third mud flood and everything else, all the different uh, volcanic activities that were going on, the collapse of billions of acres of farmland or fertile agricultural land in Northern Russia, it was really disastrous. It really did spell out the, the demise of Great Tataria and what it represented and, and foremost what it represented spiritually to millions of inhabitants in that civilization. Because I know China got involved with taking parts of Tartaria as well. So what happened there? Okay, so if you look at the original map, so the original maps going back to the um, late medieval period, um, the cartographers that started to really draw some very detailed diagrammatic uh, maps of Great Tatara. We see it's very unified. And as we go through the many years of these different maps of Great Tataria and Northern Russia, we suddenly see this region called Cathay, spelled C-A-T-H-A-Y, which actually was Western China. Now, that was fully under the influence and the control of the dynastic Chinese emperors but eventually what happened is that was renamed Oriental Tataria which was essentially Eastern Tataria so a huge chunk was then taken by the dynastic Chinese from the influences of Great Tataria now you know we have to remember the whole mindset of the Tatarian Aryans probably very different to the outlook that many Western Europeans and North Americans had when it came to the use of troops and soldiers and 
guarding and protecting land masses or territories, invading land masses and territories. We have to understand that they, you, you can say, well, then what was the reason behind that happening? There could have been many reasons. And why was there so little resistance from these Nordic Tatarians or Tatarian Aryans? You know, why did they not try and prevent it? Because they were a civilization based on mutual consent. It was based on different ethnic groups, whether it's the Turkic communities, whether it was the, the Samuel, the Laplanders, or these more Slavic, Caucasian, you know, Aryan type uh, Tatarians, all working together, pr- you know, productive, harvesting fruits, vegetables, cereal crops, uh, using um, very intricate and quite sophisticated bartering systems. There wasn't an emphasis on notage and coinage and therefore the third party debt usury system. And I also, I actually believe that's another reason why Great Tataria had to be slowly eradicated through geopolitical fragmentation um, to being where it is today as part of the Russian Federation, was that the people there were not going to simply go along with legally consenting to having a third party you know, debt-based usury banking system introduced. And the same thing could be seen really with many of the, the indigenous American Indians, both in the United States of America and in Canada, where there was such resistance for centuries to the idea of money, to the idea of debt, because for well over 60,000 years, they used very intricate bartering and trade. And I believe the same thing had gone on had gone on with the actual uh, Tatarians as it had gone on with the Scythian Aryans um, who had inhabited northern Russia, who were the predecessors to the Tatarians who had inherited the collapse of the civilization of the Scythians, and that's, uh, you know, greater Scythia and lesser Scythia in in, in northern Russia and also going down into southwestern Russia you know, to, to today where we see countries like Ukraine and bordering parts of Eastern Europe as well. So there were many reasons why it had to go. And there were different, shall we say, levels of impetus that were put into motion, I would say, by the European aristocracy. However, there's not really a lot of documentation, apart from what I've shown with Catherine Romanova or Catherine the Great. Again, she was very much part of the social grouping that can be defined as the European aristocracy. We have to remember that Catherine Romanova or Catherine the Great was actually born Sophie Frederick August Ascania. And she was actually of, of extraction genetically of, from Germany. She was of German royalty. What so, a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> what a surprise. So you can see that when it comes to monarchies and royalty, it's got less to do with, um, you know, your genetics and your upbringing and your lineage and that Pacific landmass that you're in. It's more to do with financial and marital arrangement for the idea of preserving and managing resources, property, lands, uh, you know, precious metals, as well as coinage and notage. And that's really what you know, Catherine Romanova or Catherine the Great was about an imperial Russia. Imperial Russia really was very much influenced by the Roman Catholic Church, as it was by the ideas and concepts of the European nobility or European aristocracy. So, yeah, it was really a an, an epoch really was coming to an end with Great Tataria, where the idea of Christ consciousness as being the emphasis for most of the people by and people having vocations or types of employment that were fully attuned on it to their own soul personality. And so I just say again, please people understand what Christ consciousness is. It's very, very distorted. Uh, I've noticed in some of the comments previous to this, that people talk about Christ consciousness and think we're talking about in a religious sense, in the sense of a cross, of course, it's got them connotations, but it's a vibration. Okay. Understand it's the higher consciousness that we can all reach. And this is what we ultimately are. I've known about Tartaria probably for, since about 212, but it was related yeah. a lot to the whole flat earth theory. So yeah. it's only been in the last four or five years, this has really come to the forefront and really coming out. And it feels like there is a push for this information to be revealed to people and people to know about this. But what I really want to understand is, is that 
how and i can understand from people's perspectives coming into it they're told that it was destroyed by mud floods and then it's automatically they switch down because it's almost that how can a civilization be destroyed i mean how was all this telluric energy and all this free energy around the planet suddenly cut short was it a a, a shock or was it like some sort of I don't know, electrostatic charge that that did this throughout the, the planet. or Because this telluric energy is still there and we can still tap into it. But some of maybe some of these buildings are still active, but these buildings that were Tartarian buildings don't seem to be active using that sort of energy now. I would say if you go back to the final destruction of the civilization of Atlantis, that's the, the remaining Ad Atlantean islands that were destroyed around 10754 BC to 10753 BC, you could say, well, then why did the, because we know from many of the accounts in hypnotherapy sessions that people like Delors Cannon did and, and, and numerous other individuals, mainly in the United States of America and Canada. So they've got all these client testimonies that go back and they had lifetimes incarnations in the civilization of Atlantis, either on the Atlantean continent or the Atlantean islands, and they managed to survive its destruction and they migrated to other land masses. So you say, well, then why didn't they rebuild the technology? But the point is, if a civilization is destroyed to such an extent and there's so much trauma and demographic fragmentation and so many different populations are just on the run trying to survive, and they need shelter, they need clothing, they need medical supplies, people may be injured. It's 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 very difficult for them to then, you know, suddenly say, right, let's reintegrate all of this and let's rebuild all this occult technology. You have to remember that in every civilization, only a minority of individuals actually develop, produce, design, and manufacture that kind of occult technology-based devices. Very few people. Uh, would have the the know-how in terms of scientific understanding to know how to intricately rebuild you know the art the the architecture to to rebuild the capacitors to then continue drawing down you know the telluric electricity from the atmosphere into these different residential dwellings the healing temples that were then repurposed as chapels churches and cathedrals by the roman catholic church and by many of the protestant churches as well so we could therefore postulate as Great Tataria in northern Russia was obviously a much larger landmass. It's the largest expanse on planet Earth, you know, when it was at the height of its, um, shall we say, opulent existence in terms of its geopolitical and cultural influences. So with that massive destruction and the displacement of huge populations, only a minority of scientists in Great Tataria across different parts of the towns and cities of northern Russia would have the actual scientific and technical understanding on how to rebuild those electrical capacitors, the anti-gravity based occult technology for transportation purposes with their, you know, their, their aerial uh, ships and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, you can say this has happened, I think, over and over again in, in history. It has. We can we can see that there seems to be, in terms of the collective unconscious, as Carl Gustav Jung would call it, that there seems to be some issue with human beings, the way they retain knowledge as a, as a community-based or so social-based grouping. Um, and if enough trauma occurs, that acts as in itself as the, the, the predominant focus in the psychological outlook of many individuals. And they're imprinted with that, but there isn't this urgent need to preserve the loss of an occult technology. So I would say that's what happened. And when we look at how bad the second mud flood and then the third mud flood were, combined with all the other factors coming from all this volcanic activity that I've already mentioned, and you just take a look at all this obsessive need by the European aristocracy to deliberately um, look at geopolitically fragmenting down the cultural influences of Great Tataria because it was a civilization based on unity and the idea of true equality amongst all the different brothers and sisters of different ethnicities and groups across northern Russia. And that was used as a cultural exemplar 
re really for different um, ethnic groups across planet Earth, including obviously the Native American Indians, the First Nation Indians, and all the way down into different communities and societies of Latin America. It was quite It was unique. a map for us, wasn't it? It was a map for humanity yeah. to understand and connect and connect back to our astral ancestry, you know, and what we are. I, I, I The more I've looked into this hmm. subject, I've got more and more it just connects more and more alien and it does sort of seem like certain actions that happen on this planet where we're in a complete inversion it feels to me that this isn't a human push thing um i i feel that there is some if not all an alien influence we're being told this socially it, uh, by other means as well by things appearing in That's the right. skies and you know the american government saying various things announcing certain subjects on television i i feel that we were given there is something that wanted to us to think in a certain way and it wanted to reprogram us and it wanted to recondition the human race and it's done it in a very harsh way obviously right. people don't have that contrast and i feel that that is the reason why tartaria ultimately is destroyed because it's the contrast it shows us that this world wasn't that far away and we can rebuild that world and, and actually bridge back to that world and i think we will eventually but this alien control that i feel that is in our society without us even being aware to it um is connected to this and i i feel that the you know i feel with you know this goes back to our ancient knowledge and hyperborea and all these kind of civilizations that existed previous to us i think atlantis was one of them but i think there's been a lot more and probably maybe even ones where we don't even know about which would probably blow a lot of minds uh but there are probably uh, it's probably a lot more happened than we believe but what do you feel about it being i know you mentioned it earlier about the 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 directed energy weapons and the zeta reticulians and all this but just give us the outlook on because i i i believe there's a re as we know the reset is reconditioning people and what was going on in the 1800s and it's led us to this point that recondition and now we're in a I feel quite a bad way in society. And this is due to all this, this reset that's happened previously, right? That is right. So, I mean, if you look, okay. So if we look at um, the, the Rigelian greys, also known as the Orion greys and also known as the Griadans, the reason they're called the Griadans is it's not purported. They inhabit a, a, a world known as planet Griada that orbits Rigel A. And a Rigel A is actually part of a of the Rigel system. There's Rigel B, Rigel C, Rigel D. But from planet Earth, using telescopes and binoculars in the night sky, you can only see uh, Rigel A because Rigel B, C, and D are all actually situated behind it directly. So oh right, on. okay, yeah. Wow, just, just, just the way just the position, your alignment, is. right? There is an alignment out out with, and they're concealed, which is interesting. Mm. What's beyond and that alignment? That would be interesting. <laughs> yeah, and obviously Rigel A is uh, obviously part of the Orion constellation. Now, mm. if we go back to the 20th of February 1954, we have what is known as the Griada Treaty that was apparently a, it was agreed upon between you know US President David Dwight Eisenhower and this obviously was at Murrock Army Airfield that's now become Edwards Air Force Base in Kern County in Southern California. Now, before that Griada Treaty took place, actually the, the actual, I think at the time it was the US Army Air Force, I think it was, had already had three previous, shall we say, interstellar treaties with the same Rigelian Greys or Orion Greys. And and just out of interest, where when where was that set up and when? Because obviously you had the Griada Treaty, which was signed, but previous to that, there was more. So when did them, them events happen? They were all treaties that were signed within the United States of America. Uh, they were all obviously connected to the military industrial complex. And but the shall we say the 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 ultimate treaty was the Griada Treaty that was signed on the 20th of February 1954. Now that allowed in exchange for certain amounts of advanced occult technology from the Rigelian Greys uh, that they would be allowed to take certain quotas of American citizens and that means you know, abduct them so they could extract DNA, 
tissue and organ samples, which then they would use presumably to create a hybridization program between the use of homo sapien DNA or human DNA and the genetics of the Rigelian greys themselves. So these abductions were, take, were basically scheduled, were facilitated by using their drones or servants, the zeta reticulin type A greys and the zeta reticulin type B greys. They're the classic short three to four feet tall greys that everybody's familiar with. You see them in the X-Files and, and countless numbers of science fiction movies from Hollywood and so forth. Now, behind these um, extraterrestrials was a much more powerful group known as the Mantids. Mm. Now, these have a goldish, greenish um, complexion. They're extremely large insectoids. They are super psychic and super telepathic, and they actually are able to traverse what was now known as hyperspace, which is um, really part of the higher astral. And these beings have a very strict, very regimented hive mind or hive mentality, and they don't like homo sapiens or human beings because we have free will, we are artistic, we are creative, we have imaginations, human beings can be irascible, emotionally volatile, and because of that, this is why they became so obsessed with trying to control humanity. Now, how far back that goes, we could theorize that it could possibly have been them ultimately who wanted the destruction of Great Tataria in northern Russia because of the aspirations to Christ consciousness, free energy systems, I mean, complete boundless amounts of free lighting and heating. So there wasn't a cost of living obsessiveness in the minds of human beings. It was uncontrollable. <laughs> yeah, it, because there was this idea that human consciousness was without limits, which is actually true, it is. So right. I would say on a much higher level that, the, you know, we can really go into some very deep theological ideas here, but we don't really have the time for that now, that perhaps the universal creator, the archangels, the angels, and light beings, this is all part of a much wider spiritual process for the, the learning through many, many different incarnations of human beings, that these beings act, if you like, as agents of Satan or Lucifer, that human beings have to overcome them spiritually to augment and strengthen their own consciousness i mean now i i believe that and i do feel that as, as horrible as things may seem these these do test us these things give us experiences a lot of people want it want a good world but if it was all just a good world what would we learn we might have positive experiences but there is so much for people to undo and and to discover in themselves and these experiences as traumatic as they may be, actually do bring us to a point of awareness. This is like we said before, previously, about not becoming angry about this. This is vital because we can actually learn such a great vital information for all our own soul experiences. Mm. And I feel that, Steve, you know, and I I, I feel that, that it's, it's very upsetting when you look at what happened during this reset process. But the learning that's gone on is immense. And, you know, what these souls went through going on them journeys was horrible. You know, orphan trains, all the migration, certain things that happened. But yeah. their souls would have learned and, and become a lot stronger. And a lot of people, I don't feel, understand what the soul loop is. So they, they've they missed the whole concept of what life is. That, you know, if we're not learning, we're just coming back again anyway. So it really is. I feel that anyway. But well, you can see the same thing has gone on repeatedly if, even if you look back to the time of the crusades in the medieval period you had millions of children across mainland europe who believed that they were fighting for christendom against the muslim world that marched and traveled over hundreds of kilometers you know down into where israel is today most of them never even reached their destination and the things that went on and those children disappeared from history and so when we look at the orphan train movement in the United States of America and similar, shall we say, political events that were taking place with children being moved around in different countries in Western Europe, say in Spain, Portugal, Italy, and to some extent in France and Germany, 
it was really an industrialized process because when it comes to children, they have incredible consciousness, their thoughts, their creativity, their innocence, you know, is, is pristine. It's, it's incredible. So you need those young generations to grow up strong, intellectually focused, academic, self-motivated. You know, you want them to have a, a, a wonderfully loving father and mother and uncles and aunties and grandparents, close-knit communities and societies, all of which were very much the essence of Great Tataria in northern Russia. And look at all the fragmentation, all this emotional, psychological, financial, historical, racial, ethnic fragmentation was going on. It was a constant, really psychic level of warfare. It's just, it's horrible. It's just constant divide. I mean, and then bringing it post war, you've got like constant social conditioning, the 80s, all the divorces, the marriages, break up of families, the destruction, the destruction of men, you know, the put down on men. This is, this is awful. Like we should not be living like this. And this is not the way we can move forward productively. So this, again, this is why we have to understand this past. We have to understand this past positively to move forward. There are locations which do prove that there has been this flooding and mass mud floods as well. One of which is a place called Gimana, a village, which is a lake that only, which actually turned into a lake, this village only 45 years ago, uh, where they actually had one of the largest copper mines right next door to it. And they just opened up the dams and flooded the whole village. You have never heard of this. All these people as well were meant to be paid money from the governments and they never received a penny. All around the world, there are many, many ornate looking cities. Spain, Ontario, you know, there's a lot of places which have got villages, cities buried underneath water mud right. this is this is all over the place and so that, that's that's why no, nothing could come back from in terms of the mass production of new kinds of occult technology and the rebuilding of great tataria because you know putting conspiracy theories aside and whether it was rigelian grays also known as the orion grays or the creadans and their their drones that caused it because they were ordered to do so by these golden mantid these 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 hyperspatial insectoid extraterrestrials or not it's kind of like june like the worms going through space you know <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's good yeah the time lords <laughs> yeah that's uh, yeah the, the 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 spacing guild of yeah. uh june that's right and they're called the, the original Nav- lands yeah the navigators so but then you take a look back and you, you think to yourself well this was a very long-term process so if if there were centuries of destruction taking place on different levels and the, the pinnacles of all these, the first mud flood, the second mud flood, the third mud flood, when you take a look at many of these black and white photographs taken from many different towns and cities across the United States of America, across different cities in Canada, different countries in Western Europe, and you, you know they excavate down 30, 40, 50 feet, and you can see the fenestration of huge windows and doors that are way below street level. But it's not just the windows. Many of these excavated out areas, they bring the archaeologists in, the town planners do, before they obviously rebuild that urban landscape. But the point is, many of those areas that are 30, 40, 50 feet below street level in these different cities across the United States, America, Canada, Western Europe, and many other locations, and actually in parts of Latin America as well. What what comes to mind is you notice there are actually doors there. Well, mm-hmm. why would they need to build doors that 40 to 50 feet below street level if it was a basement area? That means they would still have had to excavate out maybe 15 to 20 feet out with a huge, you know, like subterranean area where people could walk around in the open air around the building Mm. uh, with probably sets of stairs that would then go up to street level but then again you would find remnants of those staircases going up to street level and remnants of the pavements none of which have ever been found the logic dictates that they were built as forms of tatarian architecture as original buildings and that was actually the ground floor not a, a, Mm. a first basement or second basement area but what, just out of interest, why do you think that's in towns, many towns? Because obviously in London, there's quite a lot of that as well, where there, there's definitely seems to be buried underneath. Do you think there's a, what, how would it have happened in London or England? I mean, with the mud, was there mud floods in England? 
Not particularly, no. There has mm. been flooding in London. I mean, there was other forms yeah, it was of the London floods, wasn't there? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the River Thames has burst its banks many times, causing localised shoreline flooding. But the, the 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 whole of the United Kingdom, whether it was known as England or Albion at the time, becoming the United Kingdom under, I think, King James Stuart I, I, I think the whole point is this island's always been for thousands of years uh, almost like a, a, an operational centre for many of the rollout of different policies of mm. the elites and the secret societies, probably going back to the time of the, 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 the Irish Druids and the British Druids and the Celtic Britons and so forth. So what we need to remember is, for example, with London, you had obviously... Great fire of London. Yeah. Great fire of London. So that <laughs> swept through central London where there was large amounts of very ornate Tatarian buildings from Sunday the 2nd of September 1666 to mm. Thursday the 6th, there again is that number, of September 1666. Oh, right. oh wow. So there's a Six lot of play on the number oh. of the beast there. So <laughs> yeah, I really I've got there's a lot of sixes. <laughs> and obviously the number of the beast, as you know, is the number of man. It's it's actually carbon, carbon 666. Yeah. So yeah. it's the, the subatomic nuclear, six protons, six neutrons, and then six electrons orbiting the Just subatomic Just a coincidence, nuclear. Steve. Just a coincidence. Yeah, nothing to see here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> just move along, as yep. usual. It's just another wild conspiracy just, theory, I'm, as we have exactly. to remember. <laughs> nothing to do with Western so occultism. The Great Fire of London now, yeah, fascinating time, because obviously that was a big reset period. A lot changed in, in Parliament history That's at right. that point, and a lot of, obviously, records conveniently were gone in the fire. So when, when the Great Fire of London took place, it was, again, in central London, places like Fleet Street and that general area. Which is a whole street underneath, uh, no, sorry, the Strand, which is very close to Fleet Street. There is a whole um, waterway underneath there and old shops and everything, apparently. There is. And There's actually a lot of that under London. There's a lot of underground London. Oh, that I mean, that's the subject of another talk, the idea of subterranean yeah. London. London, again, built upon layers and a bit like Rome and places like Barcelona, Paris and other cities. It's layers. Same thing, actually, you go up to Scotland with Glasgow and Edinburgh. Yeah. So what we have to remember is, is that was a, a, a cleansing process. It was a way of completely eradicating wholesale hundreds of buildings that were designed in, in this style of a Tatarian architecture so that it was a way of eradicating the past. They didn't have the use of the first mud flood, the second mud flood, or the third mud flood that came historically later on. So it was almost as if London in the United Kingdom of Great Britain was chosen early on by the elites as a centre of control and command, and therefore any influences from Great Tataria and Northern Russia had to be deleted from central London because that rebuild in their architectural style. So obviously that went through from the Tudor period in, in the Elizabethan period into Georgian the, sorry, into the Georgian age, the Victorian age, and then you had which were all uh, under maritime law as well. So under maritime law, so the whole the whole of and that's a essence, whole other subject, guys, as well. But there is a yeah. big difference between common law and maritime law, which we'll go into another day. Yeah. Sorry. So the whole the whole essence of Great Tataria having any influences over the United Kingdom of Great Britain was deleted out. And again, we can look further ahead to the time of, you know, the First World War, you know, from the 28th of July, 1914, to the 11th of November, 1918, and then World War II from the 1st of September, 1939, to the 8th of May, 1945. These were deletion processes. So there was many things that were created. Again, but sorry, the uh, one of the only things left standing around the city of London, guess what it was? St. Paul's. As so, usual. And it was yeah. beautiful. That wasn't bombed at all, but conveniently, all the houses, everything was flattened around. The buildings all around these areas, you know, even, you know, were deliberately um, targeted for destruction. You take a look at the Luftwaffe, you know, from National Socialist Germany. They People say, oh, they were just indiscriminately bombing many locations. Some were, many were actually Pacific key targets where there were buildings that had been constructed with Tatarian architectural design that had to be removed. And so, again, even, even the National Socialists from Germany were involved just as, 
you know, many of the communists from so the Soviet Union were involved in co constantly needing to eradicate, delete and suppress any knowledge of great Tataria in northern Russia. And it's, it's colonial influences in different countries in Western Europe, including parts of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. So this has been a very long term process. So if you're looking for a point of origination, so who's behind all this? And you, you know, you're you're removing layers upon layers of control, you know, lines of command, lines of management. We we're only going to be able to get into sort of deep speculation or, or, or wild speculation. You know, was it these golden mantids, these these huge super psychic, super telepathic insectoids controlling the Rigelian greys, also known as the Orion greys or the Creadans? And their drones, the Zeta Reticulum Type A grays. I just say again, if people might, or not, we don't know. People might hear this and think, you know, aliens, and think, no way, that's that's just too much mud floods, aliens. But it really is not that far out, guys. When you start looking at the history of this planet and realize the alien interaction that we've had going on for thousands of years, that you will understand this is highly possible that this is involved in some sort of alien interaction. And is it any coincidence that many of the individuals, you know, for example, in the United States of America that have been abducted, and for estimates, it's around 60 million to 70 million Americans since wow. the 20th of February 1954, when and the treaty was agreed upon, have been abducted. That is a very hard figure to kind of bring together, yeah. but that was done through database of hypno uh, regressional hypnotherapists and all different types of people right and they've amalgamated a collective yeah. database how i mean how would that have been recorded? thousands of thousands of um testimonials going under regressive hypnotherapy by, by fully trained and qualified clinical hypnotherapists you know there's so much information Steve, 70 millions this. 70 million is a huge number but even a thousand a thousand is quite a lot so yeah you know even if you had a hundred cases of that that's still quite a big <laughs> serious problem it is um, so the, the point is why were so many people being abducted and what was being done with the thousands of dna tissue a blood and organ samples these Rigelian greys were taking from all these American citizens to some extent uh, uh, people living in, in, in Canada and also in Latin America and to a much lesser extent in Western Europe and why is it so many of these alien abductees in the United States of America as an example who were taken on board their spacecraft under hypnosis see these hybrids and what are the actual racial characteristics or traits of these hybrids they always have blonde hair they always have bright blue eyes yes large oval shaped eyes they're not exactly human they're humanoids because they have char genetic characteristics of both the rigelian greys and the aryan type of you know cauc caucasoidal type of human beings and look at the racial characteristics of the nordic tatarians or the tatarian aryans was this, and you go back to the time of the civilization of the Scythian Aryans and before that, the Hyperboreans, who were Nordic Aryans. There seems to be some very long term interdimensional uh, racial and genetic connection between these Rigelian greys. Then we can then postulate, obviously, these golden mantids, these insectoid extraterrestrials that control them who had a particular dislike to the Aryans of Great Tataria because they seem to be teachers, facilitators of the Christ consciousness for many different groupings on planet Earth, especially in northern Russia. You know, I mean, it, it's truly incredible. When you look at the actual Sami folklore or the Laplander folklore of their mm. stories or accounts of these uh, Aryan-type beings that were living in the northern hemisphere in the Arctic uh, North Polar region, for example, living in the Kola Peninsula, the Mamangsta Blast in northwestern Russia, living in the Yamalo Nenets Autonomous Ukrug of north central Russia. In the I, would I, I would love to get up and there and interview them. Sorry, I'd love to get up there and interview them. I, I, I would, I, I think yeah. it'd be fascinating to actually well, go and interview these people and to see what they actually say about all this and their history and stuff. And that even till this day, we know that the, the networks of Hyperborean pyramids that were known in, in the English language as crystal pyramids or shining pyramids are known to still exist because Russian archaeologists and Russian anthropologists have actually traveled on numerous occasions over the last 100 years or so up into the Kola Peninsula of the Mamangsta Blast in northwestern Russia, north central Russia, into the polar Urals and 
into the northern Urals, and they've gone up into the Kamchatka Peninsula of the Russian Far East and Siberia and found the remnants of these pyramids. And the stone is made of granite. They were built with precision using some kind of acoustic-based occult technology, very similar to the occult technology that was used by the the, the Nordic Tatarians across the different towns and cities of northern Russia. Or on the coast. Yeah, mm. so there's, there's a lot, lot of connections there but you don't see Western science going near any of it. Again, you certainly won't see the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. going anywhere near this kind of information. But if you go and look at Russia, there are numerous videos, obviously in Cyrillic Russian, they're not translated into the English language, by fully qualified Russian academics on these subjects, investigating these Hyperborean pyramids, talking about the existence of Hyperborea as a an authentic civilization with its collapse in the Rafaean Mountains, which is in the, what is known today as the Polar Urals and the Northern Urals of North Central Russia. Out of that arose the civilization of the Scythians, and from that arose the civilization of Great Tataria and Northern Russia. So the genetics and lineage was passed on through those the first civilization and the second civilization into great tataria so there's a lot of unanswered questions there and you don't see a lot of people in the western world certainly not in in western europe or the united kingdom of great britain or north america really looking at any of this and asking what on earth is going on you know it's incredible well you can see you know you had World War One, World War Two, post-war, you had the 50s, 60s, rock and roll, 70s, hippie age, psychedelics, drugs started coming into society, right. 80s. You had this, all these gadgets come around. Predictive it, it, programming, culture you can, creation. You can see how it's rolled on. And now, in the, obviously, in the 21st century, we've got the internet. We've got all this vast amount of information. And people can look at a lot of the wrong information quite easily. And it can get quite confusing to a point where people are just like, no way, this is too much. Is there anything else you'd like to add about that? There is so much we could talk about the reset. But tell me more from any perspectives you got. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the amount of information we could carry on discussing, it's just vast. It, there's so much intricate detail, historical events, specific, you know, specific dates that we could mention when events took place. But I, I, I really like to sort of, um, sort of conclude with this bit of very interesting information. We've got to remember that up until the 31st of December 1815, the landmass of Great Tataria, and northern Russia was the biggest territory on planet Earth. It had an expanse of over 3,058,102 square miles, which equates to 7,920,484 square kilometers. Wow. So all the calamities, whether they were artificially induced or, uh, or and or were, uh, you know, from natural disasters, ultimately resulted in Great Tataria becoming nothing but a small Soviet republic. Now it's a republic of the Russian Federation today and is not accepted as historically as ever existing by Western science. It's just classed as a wild conspiracy theory. Amazing. Thank you so much for your amazing words. Um, we've got our book available, Mysterious Realities. You can buy it in paperback or, and in ebook on Amazon. The links are below. Also, you can buy direct from my website. Thank you again, Stephen. And it's a bye from me. And it's goodbye from me. Mm -hmm.